All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar, The Five Secrets for Improving Your Charity Auction Timeline. Today we're going to be speaking about silent auctions. I know there's a lot to cover, so we're just going to get started here. Um, a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Uh, all attendees are going to be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, all these, or these slides will not be distributed, but a video version will be sent out via email, so definitely look for that. Um, in case you have to leave early or, uh, or missed it for some reason. If you have any questions, you can type it into the question pane over on the right of your GoToWebinar portal there. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, um, so uh, definitely stick around for that. Always a good conversation to be had there. You can also live tweet us at WinspireMe or at SR Auctioneers using the hashtag auction timeline. My name is Ian Loth. I'm the marketing director here at Winspire, and I am honored and thrilled and uh, just so excited to be welcoming uh, one of the best benefit auctioneers in the nation. Uh, he just has raised countless millions of dollars for nonprofits uh, out of Naples, Florida, Scott Robertson. Welcome, Scott. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, the unsung heroes of this business are the people that are online right now. They're the volunteers. They're the development directors, the staff that really makes it all happen. And it's wonderful because they donate, you know, just countless hours. And because you're on the webinar, I know you want to make it better. So that, that really feeds right into my wheelhouse. Fantastic. Uh, just a few things before we get started here. Uh, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Winspire, uh, we, we produce travel experiences, no-risk travel experiences uh, for nonprofit auctions, live, silent, and raffles. Uh, we've raised in excess of $43 million for nonprofit causes, supported over 28,500 28, events globally, and booked over 68,000 satisfied winning bidders. Uh, we're definitely here to support you uh, in the live auction, and we have a lot of fun doing it. And Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice over there? Well, and I just want to echo what you said about Winspire. I've been using Winspire packages at fundraising auctions for years, and I've got to tell you, I mean, it's a hundred percent satisfaction rate. It, you know, Winspire does just an absolute amazing job. They go above and beyond the call, so it's pretty great. And I've been a fundraising auctioneer uh, since 1994. I like to say I was a fundraising auctioneer before it was cool. Uh, I've been consulting for and conducting fundraising auctions as, a, you know, this is my full-time business and my full-time professions. Uh, conducting fundraising auctions, not only my passion, but, there, you know, that, that, as I always say, I eat, sleep, and breathe fundraising auctions. I'm a total student of the game and always wanting to learn more and teach more as well. So that's who i am and i will i'm going to brag for just a moment but since 2012 uh scott robertson auctioneers has helped raise over 120 million dollars for various organizations around the country wow outstanding well um scott robertson the voice of experience you can find scott at the uh, definitely check it out he's uh he's absolutely a great resource uh, before we get started today, I wanted to. I thought it'd be good to get everyone kind of involved here and do a quick poll of our audience. Uh, we wanted to ask you guys, what is your biggest challenge with regard to the silent auction? Is it A, attracting people into the silent auction area, B, getting attendees to show up on time, C, finding enough space for your silent auction items, or D, building an attractive display for your items? So I'm going to actually send out this poll. If you look at your screen, uh, you'll be able to, to actually vote. Uh, we're going to open up the polling in progress. Again, go ahead and uh, tell us about what your biggest challenge is with regard to the silent auction. We want to know uh, because it can help us kind of tailor what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, we've got a lot of really cool results coming in. Nice. We've got about 40% of you guys voted, 50%. Uh, if you looked on your screen, you should be able to see. Check it out. Uh, we've got 60% of you guys. Awesome. Uh, very interesting. Okay, cool. Now, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds to vote if you haven't already. Uh, five seconds. All right. I'm going to close the poll and let's share those results. Uh, so this is pretty interesting. So um, what do you think about this, Scott? <laughs> I think that's about where I thought this would fall. Uh, like, it looks like the key thing is getting people into the silent auction area. We have to separate them from their friends. We have to separate them from the bar, and we've got to get them into the silent auction area. 
And if I could just jump in for a moment and tell you my one of my keys here is that people don't like to stand in lines. They don't like to be in the queue, if you will. So if you're going to have two bars in your silent auction area or, or you know, within your cocktail reception, put one bar deep, deep in the heart of the silent auction. When people see there's no lines at the back bar, they'll migrate there. And that's where, and then they have a tendency to stay. And I grew up on a farm in Kentucky, so I, I often say that people at fundraising auctions are like cattle. They go to <laughs> where the food and water are, and then they don't necessarily go anywhere else. So if you can position, you know, pass the appetite, the hors d'oeuvres, and put that bar in the back corner, and the people will find their way back there. If not, they'll just stand in the front. So that's my um, first hint of the day right there. Love it. Well, that's, uh, I think that dovetails really nicely into what we're going to be talking about next, uh, which is uh, how to schedule your silent auction. Uh, you know, scheduling is a big part of, uh, you know, making sure that you are doing everything you need to. Um, and we can talk about making sure that folks get into the silent auction area with that. Did you want, want to say anything about scheduling before we get into it here, Scott? Well, absolutely, Ian. And, you know, you and I have had this conversation, but I want to share it with everyone else. Um, you know, I've done thousands of fundraising auctions, and I find that the largest single issue with fundraising events is either a bad, an inferior timeline, one that didn't really address the needs that we needed, and and the second one is, is staying on that timeline. You can write down a timeline on paper, and it can be perfect. But if you don't adhere to that timeline, you're setting yourself up for failure. So, and my Very recommendation good. always when you're looking at timeline is what I wish family members would do when they come to your house or when you go to their house for the holidays. What time do you think you'd like to wrap this up? <laughs> if we knew that, it would make life so much more enjoyable over the holidays. I see a lot of nodding heads out there. But if we know we want the fundraising to end at 930, then we should plan everything else in accordance and make sure that we do hit that mark that we're trying to accomplish. Because at the end of the day, the timeline is one of the most important elements of the entire event. I think, yeah, that speaks really well to our next slide. And I, I've heard you say this a, a number of times now. Yes, the enemy at any fundraising event is the clock. You're constantly battling the clock. And if you're ahead of the clock, let's say you were hoping that something was going to be in place by a, you know, a certain amount of time and you find yourself five minutes ahead of time, don't exhale and waste those five minutes. You're going to need them somewhere later on. If you get ahead of the timeline, that's a win. Keep winning keep winning. Now, I'm not talking about when you shut down the silent auction, but I'm talking about other things. When you get the people in the door, when the bars are at capacity, when right. all that, if, you get, if you're ahead of the, the uh, clock, you're winning. I love it. Well, let's start so by uh, talking a little bit about the beginning of the schedule, you know, welcoming guests. When, when should they start uh, in order to get things off to the right foot? Well, most people are going to say that if doors, and let's just plan on everything that we discussed today, that the doors to the event are going to open at 6 o'clock. So most people are going to think, I'm going to start talking about 6 o'clock, and I'm not. I'm going to move it back earlier. First, you should have a time for when all your silent auction, when the silent auction room is ready. And may I recommend that be at least for early as 4 o'clock. Then allow people to have time to go change, to do what they need to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when they come back, they're ready. They're ready to go, and they're not stressed. Stress, stress is absolutely a contagious behavior. So let's not stress. Then let's gather all the volunteers, all the staff members, and everything together at five o'clock, and tell them that we're going to take their picture. If you tell them that, they're almost guaranteed to be there on time, looking good and ready to roll. And now that you've assembled everyone there for the picture, who's the volunteers, the staff, the board members, everyone like that, now we've got a chance to talk to the entire group that's going to be volunteering and are going to be our ambassadors for the evening. So we want to tell them what we're expecting. We want to thank them, more importantly, for being there and all they're about to do. 
and we want to get them revved up so that at 550, everyone is in position. Everyone is in position at 550. Again, we're lowering the stress level. And then when the doors open at 6 o'clock, we're ready. Um, What happens at 6 o'clock? At 6 o'clock, we want people to feel welcome. We don't want to welcome them when they walk in the door of the silent auction area. We want to welcome them at the door of the venue. And have some well-placed board members uh, there, possibly the CEO, but someone who represents um, the group to be there and, and can call people by name. You know, it's often said, and it, and it bears repeating, people give to people. They don't give to causes. Position the people at the front door to say welcome and to direct them toward the registration area. When the people get to the registration area, you want a few more key people, and board members are great for this. You want a few more key people there thanking people for being there. And kind of, you know, if you're standing in line, and, but you're having a conversation, especially about the charity that you're trying to support, it doesn't feel too painful. If you're just standing there twiddling your thumbs, it suddenly is. So the board members can kind of act as a filter, and if there's no one standing in line at registration, you say, hey, thank you so much for being here. Registration's right over there. If there's a little bit of a line, a little bit of a queue, if you will, then maybe they want to have a little bit longer conversation and something in more general terms so that everyone feels welcome. You know, when people arrive at a fundraising event as a couple, typically one person is a little more motivated to be there than the other. So what I recommend is make them feel as comfortable as possible right away. Get them to feel at ease. And that's, that's, just, that's just real important. So once we've gotten there, the next thing, and we've gotten through registration, we're still in a little bit of an amped up mood if we're the attendee. The first thing we want is we want to have a drink in their hand. Once people have a drink in their hand, it tends to be a calming influence. Now, notice I didn't say they took a drink, that they consumed any alcohol, just that they have a cocktail in their hand. They have a glass of wine Mm -hmm. in their hand. It makes them feel as if, wow, okay, we've arrived. And it's a settling influence, especially on the person who may or may not be so motivated to be there that evening. But they feel like they've arrived. Just like when guests come over to your house, what's the first thing you ask them? Can I get you something to drink? 7 o'clock in the morning, it's probably water or a cup of coffee. You know, (laughs) later in the day, it may be a glass of wine. But it's still, it's what we do. It's a comforting feeling. Right. Having something in your hand to to then congregate around. I, I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at people when they take pictures. If they have a cocktail in their hand, they have a more relaxed look on their face. And remember, we're trying to get people to relax. We're trying to get people to enjoy. And we're trying to get people motivated to give to our charity that evening. And so you have the you have the cocktail or the bars actually in the ballroom or where the silent auction is so that they are automatically directed into the silent auction area. Because, you know, thinking about our polling question, should that be kind of the, the lure to get people in there? It absolutely should be a lure, and be careful where you place the bar, because remember my uh, inference to uh, cattle is that wherever the bar is, you're going to get people to stop and congregate, because if they have a cocktail in their hand, they have their friends around them, there's no reason for them to move any further. You can totally block an area by simply putting the bar in the wrong place. Position the bar so that everyone can see it, and better yet, position the bars You know, a bar with two bartenders, to me, is a waste. We should have separated those bars and had two bars, and that will help to make flow within the area. We want movement in the room during the silent auction. We don't want, uh, we do not want to have chairs. Mm -hmm. We can have high-top tables, but if we have chairs, suddenly chairs become real estate. And once someone sits down in a chair, they're not moving. And they're not moving for two reasons. One, hey, they're comfortable. The second one is it's their real estate. And if they get up to move, they're afraid they won't have their chair when they come back. Now, obviously, there's a few exceptions to the rule. And when you have older folks, you're going to have to have a place for them to sit down. But sit them down over on the, on the edges and on the sides. Keep the movement flowing in the room. Think of who your bidders are going to be and... 
you know, work toward them. But we want movement in the silent auction. And bars Great. can certainly help with that. Great. Let's talk a little bit about because I know alcohol can get dicey, right? Especially, you know, a concern is, you know, over serving. And, um, you know, it's, it's a delicate game that you can play because you, you want people to get a little bit loose and start having fun. Um, and that can often lead to, to actually more bidding. Um, but tell us, talk to us a little bit about your experience with how much should be served. Well, you know, lots of times conventional wisdom is, well, the more people drink, the more they'll spend, the more they, they'll just get reckless with their money. They may not like it the next day, but we'll get their money that night. I disagree. That's not how it works. What happens is you get that euphoric buzz, if you will, after the first drink or two. But then the alcohol starts going the other way with their energy level. We want people to be energetic and feeling the love when they're in the room. We don't want them feeling drunk. So we want to – it's 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 a little bit of a challenge to, um, you know, to monitor that. But as far as, like, uh, providing shots – you know, absolutely not. Don't do that. Let people work on their buzz throughout the entire evening and don't let that blood alcohol level get too high if you can avoid it. And most of the time when I see blood alcohol levels getting too high, it's because we were encouraging drinking just a little bit too much, you know, and right. shots are, are certainly, uh, you know, part of that. And what I'm about to say now, in is going to make some people uh, not very happy with me. But we also don't want, you know, people have the chairs of the event and the staff for the event, but especially the chairs. They've worked so hard all year long for the event, and they can't wait to get clothes changed, get everything going so they can have a cocktail. If I'm chairing an event, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to encourage you not to have a cocktail. You can drink as much as you want the next night, but that night we need you on point. We need you mixing right. and mingling with guests. We need you making good decisions. And if you start early, then you're going to be on the wrong side of that alcohol curve, and you're not going to be that ambassador that you really should be. Right. Uh, and the next slide, and it's kind of a trend, and it's a trend that I don't particularly care for, and it's the VIP cocktail hour. Some folks think, wow, you know what, we had, we've got great sponsors, we've got great people that always support our cause, and we want to do something special for them. So we're going to start, instead of the doors opening at 6 o'clock, for the VIPs, we're going to open at 5 o'clock and put them in a special room and let them get started early. Well, let's look back for what we just accomplished We've just accomplished that the VIPs have now consumed alcohol for an extra hour that our regular guests aren't going to uh, be consuming. They're going to be up at the top here. Yeah. <laughs> up at the top of the bell curve going down. Yeah. <laughs> we, exactly. They're on their way down when the doors open for everyone else. We're on the wrong side of the alcohol curve. So my recommendation is don't have a VIP cocktail uh, hour before everyone gets there. Also, don't have a VIP cocktail hour where you separate the P the VIPs from the other folks, because then all of a sudden we've created the have and the have nots. And there's lots of ways at fundraising auctions that we can create have and have nots, and we want to avoid that situation at all possible. So, VIP cocktail hours, I'm against them. Fair enough, fair enough. And we have a lot to cover here, and I want to make sure that we're moving through these slides because uh, we're still on the first secret and we got four more to go. Uh, but looping back to the silent auction duration. Uh, so knowing that it is uh, the span of the cocktail hour, what is your recommended duration, uh, assuming you're starting at 6 p.m.? If we're starting at 6 p.m., I would have the silent auction wrapped up by 7.30. An hour and a half of opportunity is ample time with a pen and paper uh, type of silent auction. If people arrive late, that's their problem. Right, and we'll talk about uh, how to exactly to close down the silent auction here a little bit later. But um, you, I know that you wanted to emphasize this, the importance of starting on time at that 730 mark. Absolutely, because I've never started a live auction too early, but I've sure finished them too late. And by that, I mean if you delay the closing of the silent auction, you've suddenly delayed the, the start of the live auction. And remember, your silent auction typically is going to generate about 20% of the income of the full event. 
So if you you don't you don't want to start too late because remember we want energy. Remember that alcohol bell curve. We want to stay ahead of the alcohol bell curve. When people get tired, they suddenly are no longer interested, and we're not going to get we're not going to be able to extract the money from their wallets. Right. And, and so in the importance of starting on time, you, you've mentioned before that people get, they want to open it, what, they want to keep it open because not everyone has arrived or? Well, there's a thou, there's a hundred reasons uh, that people want to keep it open. And I think I've heard them all. But, you know, the main thing is they want to extract as much money as possible during the silent auction. But if they kept their eye on the big picture, they would realize it's only 20 percent of the fundraising revenue. Do the best that you can, but keep driving forward. Because remember, it's that 930 timeline we're trying that mark we're trying to hit. And we don't want to be picking up 20 cents when we have the opportunity to pick up a dollar. And that's why I say never let the tail wag the dog. And the silent auction can be the tail that can wag the dog. Great. That's awesome. And if you guys have any questions about uh, the schedule of the silent auction, uh, please post them in the questions uh, portion over there on your right, and we'll we'll attend to them uh, towards the end. Uh, next up, announcements. Uh, you as the uh, auctioneer, uh, or maybe it's just an MC, um, how often are you making announcements and trying to direct people to the silent auction? Well, it's one of those as often as needed without sounding like a carnival barker. Uh, and your auctioneer doesn't necessarily have to be the MC, but you want your announcements to be scheduled. Like I'm going to suggest that we want to have two announcements saying welcome and thanking them for being there. Uh, And then we want to direct them into the silent auction. We want to talk about the good items and the great items that we have in the silent auction. If you have some item that's not receiving any attention, it's not receiving any bids, and it's probably just not a desirable item, I wouldn't wouldn't talk about it. I would just let it die on the vine and remind all our volunteers we do not want this item for next year. So we want to talk about the positive things. Don't beat them over the head with items that they simply don't want. And some things that we don't want to say, when we ask for their attention, we want to get the audience's attention, and we want to say something that's meaningful. So what we don't want to say are things like we have a lost set of keys. If someone lost their keys, (laughs) they're not going home without them. So just put them where you would normally put them, at registration and checkout, and that's where where they'll be. Um, Searching for a missing volunteer. Judy's not where she's supposed to be. Please make an announcement and tell Judy Green she needs to be here. We don't need everyone's attention for that. We just (laughs) need Judy Green to be where she's supposed to be. Right. And don't make announcements about other organizations. Oh, and hey, listen, if you like this tonight, you're going to love the event for the YMCA next Tuesday night. Please. We just diverted their attention from our own organization. So we Mm -hmm. don't want to do that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I hear it time and time again, you know, from other auctioneers we work with, too. You know, Danny Hooper in particular, he always says, focus on the fundraising. So make sure that every single announcement that you're making is directing folks to make more bids on the items that are already catching momentum. And uh, you're just trying to keep that momentum going. Absolutely. And and focus the entire night, and especially with your planning, focus on this is a fundraiser. This is not a friend raiser. When someone at the end of the, uh, you know, the next day asks, hey, how was the fundraiser last night? They're not asking how was the food. They're not asking about the color of the tablecloths. They're not asking about the decorations. They want to know one thing. How much money did you raise? Mm-hmm. So keep your eye on the prize, and the prize is the fundraising dollars. As far as the silent auction so, items go, though, you know, what are some things, some specific announcements you can make um, that, you've, that you find yourself making a lot with regard to the silent auction? Yeah. Well, one is time for auction closing. We want that to be printed so that everybody can see it. We want it to be hopefully up on a wall so that everybody can tell when. We don't want any confusion. Confused bidders and donors don't bid. So we want no confusion. We don't want to make anyone disappointed with that. So we want to make announcements about time. We want to identify the location of the silent auction if it's not uh, really apparent. Because as 48% of the folks said, we are having a hard time getting them into the silent auction area. Well, let's, let's make it welcoming, and let's make sure that we make some announcements there. We talk about hot items, and we also talked about if there's an item in the silent auction that's just not doing well, let it go. You'll be much better served. Focus on the positive. 
focus on the positive, focus on the fundraising. That's great. And I should have put a little overview of what we're going to be talking about here today. But for those of you who are, uh, everyone's asking about mobile bidding, that we're going to be talking about that as uh, uh, coming up here very shortly and how that changes the whole scope of the silent auction. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk about electronic and modal, mobile bidding here very shortly. Um, so talking about, you know, silent auctions, you've met, you've opened it up, you've welcomed guests, uh, you've made your announcements, you're directing people. Now it's getting to that 730 mark and it's time to to start closing in sections. And this will be different uh, again for for mobile bidding. So stay tuned for that. But assuming that you don't have bidding technology that you're using, uh, what do you usually recommend for closing uh, the silent auction, Scott? Well, one thing is I like to create a bit of a frenzy, and I like to close in sections. And when by sections, I mean that we have uh, specific areas within the silent auction, and usually pick one, usually pick three or four sections in the silent auction. I recommend closing them five minutes apart from each other. Ten minutes is too long because it allows people to go do something else. So if we were going to close this, the final section of the silent auction at 730 and we had four sections, the first section would close at 715, the next section at 720, the next section at 725, and of course the last one at 730. Now one of the things that I like to do is I like to identify the sections by color. And that can be with balloons overhead. That's kind of helpful. Also with various colors of tablecloths that have a distinctive color, the blue section, the red section, so that everyone understands what we're talking about. And realize that if you had four sections, and let's say we had uh, we had 60 items. Well, if we do the math, then you're saying, well, we should put 15 items in each section. Not necessarily. The first item, the first section that I closed, might only have seven or ten items in it. And they're probably going to be a little bit of the lower-valued items. Because uh, if, if we're going to have a sacrificial lamb to get people f motivated about bidding... Uh, what, did you, what do you mean by sacrificial lamb? A sacrificial lamb, meaning that maybe you didn't get quite as much money as you would like to have for those particular items, but be, but you go ahead and you sacrifice them early to help to create the bidding frenzy for later on. It's, you know, it's sort of doing the takeaway. People felt you know, that they had all the time in the world, and now all of a sudden, wait a minute, those seven items are no longer available. Well, I need to really focus in on the silent auction so that I can... So that, and that's going to create a bidding frenzy. You know, here we are at December the 20th, and I bet most people have completed their Christmas shopping. I also bet that a lot of people didn't, hadn't started shopping at November the 30th. You know, what's created the buy light to go on? I find around December the 15th, people quit Christmas shopping, and they start Christmas buying. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't really care what the cost is. They just have to get this task completed. And that's sort of what happens in a silent auction. There's suddenly the de people don't need more time. What they need is a deadline. And that deadline needs to be announced. It needs to be in print. And everybody needs to know about it. And it's amazing how much attention you can suddenly focus on the auction if you shut it down this way. If you wait till the very end, it it enters. It kind of ends a little flat. If you do this, it ends with a flourish. I love it. I love it. So, uh, splitting it up into sections, you know, splitting it up by value, closing down the 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 you know the ones with the least amount of value first, and saving your best you know sections for last to really create that compression and incurs the buying frenzy. Uh, fantastic. Yes, and, and, and just to clarify, Ian, that doesn't mean that we're going to start from the very lowest dollar and work our way up. It just means that we're going to put some lower dollar items in the first sections. But we're going to have a, a value of ranges, uh, or a range of value, if you will, on each in, within each section, uh, except for possibly that last section, which is kind of near and dear to both our hearts, the super silent auction. Right. And the super silent auction... Um, well, Ian, why don't you explain it? Because you did such a great job when we talked previously. Right. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Super Silent Auction, the Super Silent is a, um, a, a separate section of the Silent Auction where it's uh, reserved for your best Silent Auction items. Maybe they're items that didn't make it into your live auction because you don't want to have too many live auction items. Um, so they didn't quite make it into your live auction, uh, but you want to set aside a section that has a little bit more uh, pizzazz, a little more hoopla, maybe more balloons. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, you know ropes, like red ropes around it. 
Um, and that's a great place for you know Winspire travel experiences, um, higher priced items, uh, maybe items that have a harder, more difficult to value, uh, like artwork or, or things like that. Um, and it's the, the section you want to close last. Uh, but the idea here is to, to really kind of set it apart as your, as your you know, super items um, to, to, to attract folks. Yes, and we definitely want to make sure that we close the super silent last. We want to have done the takeaway with all the other tables, and people are like, wow, we really need to focus in. Another advantage to shutting it down in sections is that people are able to follow, you know, to, to protect an item, if you will, and eat within each section. And so now the sudden we've done the takeaway and the takeaway, and now we're getting the room all revved up. The noise in the room should be getting louder. The person who's making the announcements, uh, you know, should be doing a good job with that and really creating a frenzy around, along the super silent auction. A, a byproduct of this, not only will your silent auction raise more money, it also creates a buyer frenzy that's going to tra- that's going to uh, transition into the live auction and the special appeal. So how you, we want everything to be focused on fundraising, and one um, element supports another. Love it. That's great. That's awesome. And we've got some great questions about the Super Silent Auction that we'll answer here at the end, so stay tuned. Um, but I think everyone's kind of curious. Um, uh, I know I'm getting a lot of questions about this. How does electronic bidding change the scope and change the landscape of the silent auction? Because I know it's a very different uh, event when, uh, you know, without electronic bidding, we've recommended closing it before the live auction, closing it in sections, uh, doing all of that. If you're using regular bid sheets, uh, how does electronic bidding change that, Scott? Well, electronic bidding uh, does change it uh, for a couple of ways. One is we don't need as much time. Uh, with electronic bidding because I'm going to recommend that the electronic bidding stay open all through the live auction and we close it down afterwards. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So if we don't have people doing the bidding, we can we can re- adjust that preview period from, say, an hour and a half, maybe back to an hour. And remember that alcohol bell curve? We're now ge- mm-hmm. we're staying ahead of it a little bit better. We're getting people with more energy into the live auction, into the special appeal. So it can really be of a, of a benefit there. Because when you're working a silent auction with pencil and paper, pen and paper, we, we have to stay on top of it. We have to keep revisiting the item that we wish to bid on. With electronic bidding, all we have to do is see the item once, Now we've identified it into our smartphone, and we're able to keep the bidding going throughout. And we can be having the conversation with our friends. Our phone buzzes. We reach down. Uh, I'm not going to let them outbid me. And they they bid again. This can happen all the way through dinner and through the live auction as well. Very cool. So uh, that being said, when do you close the silent auction when it has to do with electronic bidding? You can close it. Uh, you can close it as at you know. Let's in with the timeline that we used previously. You could close it at seven thirty before people go into the live auction. However, I find that it works better if you keep the silent auction going during the live auction. It gives people uh, something to do. But one thing is for sure that we do not want to do is we don't want to close the silent auction electronically during the live auction because you suddenly will have no one paying attention to the live auction because they're all concerned about the silent auction. So my recommendation is wait until the live auction ends, work with your uh, uh, electronic bidding provider, and say that when the live auction ends, the auctioneer is going to say, we're going to close the silent auction in 10 minutes, put a countdown clock on the screen, Kick off the band, kick off the DJ, whatever your entertainment is later, and let it roll. But I would not go more than 10. Five minutes isn't enough time. Ten minutes is just right. Fifteen minutes, and people are like, you know, honey, I just wanted to go anyway. So I like 10 minutes after the live auction closes to close the electronic bidding. Now, remember, you're going to need to work with your provider because you can't say we're going to close the silent auction at 930 because if the live auction were to extend into 935, now we're closing the silent auction down during um, during the live auction and you're 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 hurting your your fundraising opportunity because suddenly everyone is looking down at their phone because they're all getting all these notifications. 
Right. And I've, I've heard uh, uh, you talk about, you know, during the live auction, uh, typically, uh, you know, you're focused on that top 20 percent of the audience. And but there's a whole there's the 80 percent that aren't usually involved in the live auction um, that can be, you know, bidding in the silent auction during during that portion of the event. Uh, so it's a great way to to keep them involved. So they're not just sitting and watching um, and, you know, keep them involved bidding. And, and and that's absolutely right. And you know, if you look at people at a restaurant, I was at a re- I looked in a restaurant window just a couple of days ago, and I saw a fam. It was obviously a family, three generations of family, grandpa, mom and dad, and the kids, and all six of them were on their smartphones. None of them were having a conversation. They were all just <laughs> looking down at their phone. It was brilliant. It was absolutely beautiful. But people are accustomed to doing that. So it's a great way to keep people engaged and to keep them in place. So well, that's a real advantage of electronic bidding. That's great. And let's continue talking a little about a few pros and cons of electronic bidding. Um, I know that... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a new it's a newer thing, but it's definitely catching on. I would say um, almost about probably a majority of our events uh, are now using it um, to you know to facilitate their silent auction. Um, you know, what what has your experience been out there with with mobile or electronic well, bidding? Um, electronic bidding is never going away. It is never going away. This is not a fad. This is just the way the future is going to look. Now, is it right for your event? That's up for you to decide. But I'm telling you, electronic bidding is not going away. And as you said, I would guess that the majority of clients. When I first saw electronic bidding was about eight years ago. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And in many aspects, it is. And I will tell you that it's way better now than it was eight years ago because it's technology and they've been able to work out a lot of the kinks. Some of the pros and the cons. First of all, millennials love electronic bidding. You know, they love anything electronic. And everyone wants to know how to engage millennials. They love electronic bidding. Uh, And as we discussed, the social hour does not need to be as long. So we're able to get the fundraising over earlier. And, folks, when you get the fundraising over earlier, you're winning. And you're winning because of the alcohol bell curve and because of the energy in the room. There's another one, and I think everybody who's on the call has probably had to referee uh, an argument over when someone made that last bid. With electronic bidding, there are no arguments. It looks like jeopardy. They try to bid, they were too late, and they get that disappointed look on their face. But there are no arguments. And I think the real big benefit to electronic bidding is that as soon as that silent auction is closed, that information is immediately transferred into the compu- into your computerized clerking system effortlessly. There's no input needed. There's no opportunity for a mistake. It's right there, and it goes in right away. The downfalls, there's an expense. There's an expense to electronic bidding. Also, some older folks who do not own a smartphone uh, don't like electronic bidding. But my experience has been if someone owns a smartphone, they have no problem at all with electronic bidding. Uh, And then there's one more downside, and that is as people walk around through the silent auction with pen and paper, they're able to look down and see which items are getting a lot of attention and which ones are not. Uh, You can't really see that on a phone because you have to go to the item to to, to find out where the bidding is. So you're not going to just walk by at a glance and see a long line versus a short line. Right. Yeah, I know a couple of events I've been to that have had electronic bidding. uh, It was was a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I was actually surprised. And I know that the technology has, has come a long way. Um, you know, a few of the big, big companies out there that are, I think, doing a really good job at this probably are, are BidPal, uh, uh, Givergy, uh, you know, Gesture, Creator Giving, just to name a few. Um, do you know, do you, do you use any specific bidding technology yourself, Scott, or do you, is that not something you touch? <clears throat> No, I use the same people that – or I recommend the same people that you're talking about. I like to kind of stay Switzerland and not necessarily, you know, put one over the other. But if you ask me direct questions, I'm happy to share. Um, One thing that you want to do is, again, don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't let the electronic bidding company orchestrate the event because they're going to set it up to focus on them. And I'm just going to jump out here and say it right now. If they tell you that they can raise more money in the special appeal than your auctioneer can, they are wrong. They are wrong. So don't let them talk you into that. They're wrong. Right. 
Right. Um, let them fight for your business. Uh, absolutely. And um, what would, would you say that uh, is there any statistics or kind of a general sense whether electronic bidding has produced better uh, results for the silent <clears throat> auction specifically? Or what are your thoughts? Right. And that's a great question. Ian. And when electronic bidding was really coming on strong, uh, the electronic bidding companies, and listen, these people are friends of mine. I work with them. I know them. We're on a first name basis. And they were all touting great records over one year versus another. But remember, in the last seven years is when the economy was coming back. So mm. the entire fundraising event was doing much better. So I don't know that they can tout that it raises more money or not. Uh, to me, it's more of looking at the statistics and see how many more people are engaged within your group. And you're only going to know that after the effect, okay? Because right. you should be keeping records of how many people do you have bidding in your silent auction. With electronic right. bidding, they print out a spreadsheet, and you can know right away. And I would say that that's probably one of the biggest benefits is just the data management, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of them have, yes. you know, they handle all the registration, and then you can see a lot of really, really cool data on, you know, the how much was bid on certain items, uh, you know, and you can use those numbers to crunch uh, or crunch those numbers and and use that to, to really decide your procurement strategy for the following, you know, for the next event or the following year. Yeah, and, and it's real data that you don't have to uh, plug in yourself. And you don't, right. you know, a lot, of, a lot of fundraising events, I deal with people and they're all speculating. And sometimes they didn't even keep notes from the year before, so they're speculating again. And that doesn't work. You know, show me the data. Show me the data. Let's make a decision based on that. And that's one of the real advantages. And let me tell you one more person that loves electronic bidding, and that are the organizers of the event because right. it makes their job more efficient. And it also makes planning for next year more efficient because, as we just discussed, you have better data. Right, right. And one last thing before we move on uh, to number five, which is uh, all about the checkout process. But, um, you know, just to kind of reiterate that electronic bidding is good for the silent auction. But, you know, typically you want to you want to keep those paddle raisers for the live auction. Right. And the, and the special appeal or fund and need, whatever you call it, uh, and getting that interaction. Isn't that right? Absolutely, because there's it's hard to generate emotion when people look down and push buttons. How do we recognize that bidder? I can look down and push a button and give $5, or I can look down and push a button and give $50,000. How are you separating me and giving me the public recognition that I deserve? And if that person you know, raises their paddle, where are their eyes? Their mm -hmm. eyes are looking forward, and they're also looking around the room. And if you've just raised your bid paddle at a significant amount, whatever that significant amount is to your charity, realize that person is also looking around the room, and they're boring holes in some people are saying, hey, come on, I'm stepping up, now you step up. Right. And you simply can't do that you know, electronically. It just it doesn't work, and it's been proven time and time again. Great. And definitely uh, to those of you out there, tune in for our part two of this uh, webinar series where we're going to be talking all about the live auction. Uh, you're gonna, we're going to provide some information about where you can go register for that. It's going to be on January 17th. Um, but this is this is just a taste. Uh, we're talking about just the silent auction here today, um, but lots, lots more to talk about with the live auction and the, uh, the special appeal. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about checkout. Do you have any um, recommendations, general recommendations about, uh, you know, how they should proceed with the checkout? We've we've talked about without the, you know, bidding technology, you've closed the silent auction prior to everyone going in and sitting down for dinner and doing a live auction portion. With electronic bidding, you can leave it open and uh, close it down 10 minutes after the live auction is done. But now we're at the checkout. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your recommendations for that. Well, one thing, you know, that we want to do is we want to make sure the checkout is easy. I maintain that if you can answer these three, say yes to these three questions, you had a successful fundraising event. Did you start on time and did you stay in your timeline? Did people have fun? Was checkout easy? If you say yes to those three items, you had a successful event. I didn't mention a word about money raised. But I'm telling you, if you can say yes to those three things, you had a successful event that people are going to want to re return to next year. And it's always about, you know, next year and the year after and the five-year plan and all that. So let's make checkout as easy as possible. First thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we have, we're properly staffed. 
mm-hmm. and that we have enough people that are to help and those people are trained and they're not going to be uh, they're, they're not going to be slow. They're going to be efficient. They're going to be effective. Remember that alcohol bell curve? It really works against you at checkout. And I'm not talking about that the people checking out. No, they're not allowed to drink at all. But the other people, they're now tired. They've now, they've drank maybe a little more than they probably should have. I don't know. But they're going to be there, and they're not going to have nearly the patience. So we want to make sure that we got everyone there and that they're all going to be patient and efficient as they're working through this. I'm also going to suggest that you have two areas of checkout. First, you're going to have the cashiers, and that's the people that are going to be taking the money and saying thank you. Then we're going to have and handing them a receipt, and that's going to say part paid, and they're going to walk over to fulfillment, which is going to be in another location, and that's where they're going to gather up your items and hand them to you in a nice shopping bag or whatever form so it's easy for them to transport those items out the door into their car and on on to home. So if you do that, then you have two short lines as opposed to one long line. If you're passing things over the shoulders of the people that are cashiering, there's a lot of confusion there. And we don't want confusion. We're dealing with people's money. We're dealing with people's donations. And remember, they're not going to be as patient as you'd like for them to be. So make it easy for them. Another thing that you can do is to to keep the lines shorter is slow the migration of the people as they're going to checkout. And if you have an entertainment component, that needs to start just the second the silent auction is over. If you have a band, the auctioneer, you know, I love to count down the band. One, two, three, four. And they start. <laughs> and hopefully that will get people on the dance floor dancing because they're going to play that first song is really key. Make sure it's something that's danceable so that it'll attract people to the dance floor. Now, we of course, we've got some people going to check out, but we've got other people that are now on the dance floor. The longer we keep them on the dance floor, the shorter that queue for checkout is going to be. Plus, people are going to have fun. If the band or the DJ or whatever your entertainment is afterwards, if they're not ready to go the second the, silent, the live auction is over, Everybody's going to be a mass exodus. You've only got a few minutes to capture their attention and engage them for after the live auction. If not, there's the exit. And remember, we're always fighting that clock. We're always fighting the clock. So as they're going to check out, we want to slow the migration in a comfortable way as we possibly can. It's also another good time to engage that board of directors and that let them be in line and thanking people for their generosity. Because they need to be thanked. They just spent a lot of money. So have them in position to thank them. Make sure that you have people, who, not just two or cashiers, but you also need some troubleshooters back there. So if there's an issue, they can step in and help to expedite the matter. In fact, you probably want to have a special table set up just in case there is an issue so that you can get them out of line because we don't want to hear someone complaining that they didn't bid whatever the issue is. You can pull them over the side and handle it. So let's talk about our checkout personnel. First of all, no consumption of alcohol. None. Zip. Nada. Do not let them. That's the way that works. And it, the best people that I find to help with checkout are people that deal with people and money every day on a regular basis, and that's bank tellers. If you've got a bank in the, t- in the community, I'm sure they would love to help sponsor. They can bring in their, their banking personnel and help out with checkout. They're also great at registration because of the same. Their skill sets are just what we're looking for. I'll tell you another skill set we're looking for, and that is for the silent auction items, if people buy, getting them to their car sometimes can be a bit of a problem. They're, they're older, the item's bulky, it's heavy, they're a little bit intoxicated. Firemen. Firemen are great people <laughs> persons. They, you know, they tend to work one day and they're off two, so there's always, and they're used to working together as a team. They're used to being nice. They're clean cut. Uh, they're great people to have to work fulfillment and to help carry items to their car because if you if someone doesn't bid on an item because they didn't want to carry it to their car, you just missed out on money. So make it easy for people. Make it easy for people. Yeah, you can even ratchet it up. Have be shirtless firemen. You know, I'm sure that would. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. And uh, yeah, just on a final note here, this, these are all such great tips. Um, uh, you, you wanted to, to finish on this, Scott. Right. Remember that the silent auction is just one piece of the entire night. I, you know, people ask me what I do, and I say I'm an auctioneer at a fundraising auction event. It's the entire event that you have to focus on, not just the live auction, not just the silent auction, not just the special appeal. It's a part of the entire puzzle. And the purpose of the silent auction is for the cocktail hour. It's to raise, to raise money with lower-priced items. It's to get people engaged. And maybe more importantly than anything is to help to educate people uh, as well as create a buying frenzy for the rest of the night to get that enthusiasm going, to get those donations flowing. It's one part of it. So don't delay the closing of the silent auction. Keep it moving. Get on, stay, get on your timeline. Stay on your timeline. Lovely. Awesome. That's great. And we got some fantastic questions rolling in here. So I encourage you all to stick around. Um, but I just want to thank Scott Robertson here um, just so much for, for coming out and uh, sharing his knowledge. Uh, I know you have some resources, uh, some more resources on your website, Scott. I do, and I'm happy to share them. If you go to the voe.com, uh, there's quite a bit of, of free information on that website, uh, including my ebook uh, that I've uh, 14 tips on fundraising uh, on fundraising auctions that you're more than happy. All you've got to do is provide your email address. Promise I won't sell it to anyone. Uh, and if you'll sign up today for that free ebook, I will put you on my distribution list so that when I write articles that are, you know, part of the hands-on, you know, in the trenches education that I get each and every weekend and sometimes during the week, uh, I'm happy to send that out to you. Uh, you know, yeah. fundraising auctions are my passion. I know I can't work at every fundraising event, but by golly, if I can help educate the masses so that they can help others, I'm all about it. Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, when I first started doing this for Winspire about five years ago, uh, Scott's blog and his website was my go-to for all things charity auctions when I was just learning how to to, to fundraise in this space. So uh, Scott has been a mentor of mine, uh, and so I wanted to say thank you for uh, putting all your materials out there, Scott. Just some great stuff. Definitely check it out, folks. Um, so thank you, Scott. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I've got to share. Now it's Mutual Admiration Society, but I've got to share the Windspire uh, blogs that Summy writes. Oh, my goodness. They're, they're wonderful. They're wonderful. Right. I read them every time. That's great. And Sunny Lau is, uh, is our, our writer here for Winspire News. We uh, work on putting out incredible content on a weekly basis um, to Winspire News. If you haven't already, definitely subscribe. Um, there's this link here. If you're a, even if you're a subscriber already, um, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card as our thank you for coming to the webinar here today. Um, so whether you're a subscriber or not, if you're not a subscriber, definitely um, check it out. At least give it a try. That's two blog posts a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, on everything to do with with improving your fundraising events. So uh, check out this link. We're going to be sending it out with the recording of the webinar as well. Um, um, we're going to be drawing the winner uh, this Thursday, 12-22. And um, your chances are probably going to be pretty good uh, if you go and enter. So uh, definitely subscribe to Inspire News. Enter to win that $100 Amazon gift card. Um, we're, again, we're going to be sending out this link uh, hopefully tomorrow morning or hopefully this afternoon. Uh, but that drawing is going to take place this Thursday. Um, and also, please don't forget to register for part two of this webinar series. If you liked what we were talking about here today, you're going to like what we talk about in January even more. Uh, this is coming up on January 17th. Uh, you can register here at this uh, link, u.winspireme.com backslash timeline part two. Uh, again, we're going to be sending out this information in a follow-up email with the recording of this webinar. Uh, but part two is going to be all about live auctions. Um, best practices there. And then part three, which is going to be at the end of January, is going to be all about the special appeal of the fund to need. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. Um, all right. We have some great questions that we're, that we're rolling in. Uh, one from Amy Floor, uh, you know, t referencing the challenges that we asked about in the beginning. Uh, we have trouble getting... Uh, Unfortunately, none of those were our largest challenges. We have trouble getting people to bid high enough to cover the minimum for the high-end items. Everyone is looking for a bargain. What can you say about that, Scott? Well, 
what you have to do, and it's so easy for me to say and so hard to do, is you have to position your 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 entire event into not a bargain yard sale type thing, but more of a let's support the cause. And you start off with education to get that going. Uh, lots of times when I find that people are just looking for bargains, I would look at the number of silent auction uh, at the number of silent auction items you have, Absolutely. and probably reduce it. Because mm-hmm. what you've done is you've created a buyer's market as opposed to a seller's market. And, you know, with, what, five days before Christmas, it's suddenly a seller's market. And if you don't believe me, go to a jewelry store and look for a bargain. There are none. Okay? Right. Go to the same jewelry store on January the 5th, and there probably will be. Right. But create, hey. a, create a, buy, a, 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 buyer, a seller's market, not a buyer's market. A good rule of thumb uh, the other that we thing always that you recommend. can do, and we didn't oh. talk about this earlier, is yeah. pre-populate the bid sheets. Yep. In other words, you put down the bid amounts on the bid sheets and let people just put in their name beside that amount. Let them skip lines if they wish. But that's a great way to uh, establish the bid increments and the and the floor to start off with bidding. Great. And let me just say, too, about creating that buyer's market. Um, we actually should have put this as a slide, but... Um, Making sure that in terms of determining how many silent auction items you should have, a good rule of thumb is to do half as many items as there are buying units in the room. And a buying unit is typically a couple, right? Because they share, uh, usually share a wallet, right? Or, uh, or a bank account. So if you have, if you have uh, 300 guests, that means there's 150 buying units roughly. And then it's good to have about 50% of that many items, right? So it's about, is it, does that sound about right? Scott, or is it less than Well, that? you know, it dep- well, y- the answer is yes, but it also depends upon your, uh, upon your audience. If you have people right. that go to a lot of fundraising events, you'll want to reduce that number of silent auctions. I have a lot of events that don't have any silent auction. But I realize that if you're a school, if you're, uh, you know, then maybe you do need, you know, more silent auction names. But no more than, you know, uh, one per every two bidding units. That right. 75 would be the max in that scenario. You know, right. too many silent auction items, you just, it, it's, it's overwhelming. People don't want to see all that. But if it's a smaller number, then they'll go check them out. Well, and then they end up going and actually shopping for that bargain because if they're walking around and all the bid sheets only have one bid, you know, then that's what you think about in terms of buyer's market. The buyers are gleeful all of a sudden because they, they feel like they can hunt around for the best deal. But what you want to do is have fewer auction items so that you know there's people start bidding on them and then people feel the pressure oh my gosh i need to place a bid now otherwise i might miss out on it and that that's what uh that's what that seller's market is absolutely and it's the same mentality you have when you have a yard sale i had a yard sale one time and i forgot what i was selling i had a dollar marked on it and the person wanted to know if i'd take 35 cents i handed them the item and i said you need it more than i do thank you (laughs) <laughs> and I didn't collect the 35 cents. And I never had another yard sale. But we right. don't want the yard sale mentality because in order to win, we have to get it at a bargain price. So we want to eliminate that mentality, if at all possible. Right. Thank you for your yeah. question. Yeah, that was great. This one's from Jessica Rio. Uh, the, uh, you mentioned that silent auctions, uh, the rule of thumb should be 20% of the event income. What are the other chunks and percentages? Well, wow, that's a great question. I would think that we would probably have another 20% in sponsorships. I would want to have uh, a probably 40% into the live auction. Uh, and it depends upon the organization, but somewhere between ticket sales, uh, somewhere near the 20 to 30% in the special appeal, uh, and then ticket sales. Right, and let's just, let me say this quickly about ticket. But that can all vary according to your event. But ticket sales never sell the tickets for less than the cost for the people to be in attendance. A right. lot of people think that they, that you know, they've done their part by buying a ticket. And let's say the ticket's a hundred dollars, but it cost a hundred and twenty dollars to get that person in their seat and fed. And you're going to sacrifice twenty dollars because you think those people will spend their money in the live and silent. Absolutely not. You're thinking incorrectly. Right. You need so to be Dre- making a profit on your ticket. Right. And there's also sponsorships in there too, but I, but that's a great, I want to reiterate that always charge enough to cover the cost of your guest being there uh, as that ticket price. I think then you're starting at ground zero uh, in terms of your fundraising efforts. 
Yes, Great and if question. you can tell, and if you can announce to the audience that you know the cost of the you know of the event has already been paid, and every dollar we raise tonight is going to go directly into the profit center for the organization, you're going to raise more money. Great, it works. So if you can get everything paid before the event happens, and everything's profit. You'll raise more money because people feel like their money's going more more going to the winning cause. That's great, and the winning cause uh, is the charity they support. Fantastic, and um, thanks. Great question, Jessica. Uh, Stephen Lee, uh, should high end packages be included in the silent auction? Uh, if so, what's the most appropriate, effective way to display that? Uh, that's what we were talking about. The super silent auction. You can absolutely have higher priced silent auction items. You don't want to overdo it. There, you want to have that exclusivity. Um, you know, just a handful of those higher priced items. Set them apart. Make sure they're highlighted. Uh, they're close to the stage, and uh, you know that's what the, that would be the last section that uh, that people close. Did you want to add anything to that, to that, Scott? No, I think you summed it up just beautifully. You know, but the main thing is don't too much of anything is too much. Got you it. know, don't have two trips that are that are so similar they're competing against each other. You know, it doesn't work. And if you have two items in the silent auction that are identical, don't put them beside each other. You know, it's it's almost, you know, it's like water. It's only going to go up as high as, you know, they're both going to go up identically. So put right. them on different sides of the room if you have two items that are the same. Right. And I think another thing we didn't quite touch on, too, is if, if certain items don't get bids uh, during your event, don't include them in your next event. Right. They, they, the audience no. is sending a signal to you that they are not interested in that item. <laughs> exactly. So don't do that. Absolutely right. do not do that. So, you know, you know, lick your wounds, accept your loss, move on. Right. Right. Use it you can use it as prizes or, or other things. Um this this question is from Katie Brown. I've seen Katie at a, a few of our webinars here. Hi Katie. Um and she wanted to know, can you explain why you wouldn't close the silent auction after the live? And I'm assuming this is for uh if you're not using electronic bidding. Well, Katie, that's a great question because let's go back to people don't need more time. What they need is a deadline. Mm-hmm. And you, the, there's the theory that what people, if they don't buy anything in the live auction, they'll spend more money in the silent auction. And I find that is not the case at all. In theory, it sounds great. But remember that alcohol curve? Well, <clears throat> people, when the live auction's over, they may not even want the silent auction items that they bid on, but they're committed to doing it, uh, and they have to be there. But we want, the, we want our items to end with a flourish, with a bang, not with a whimper. And when you close a pen and paper a- uh, auction after the live auction, it ends with a whimper. Also, we don't have very much time then to collect all those paper sheets input that information into our computer, organize the items, it becomes a logistical nightmare for, um, for the people that are working uh, registration and checkout. With electronic bidding, even though uh, the bidding still continues, you can collect all those items and get them staged into fulfillment for checkout ease. If, with pen and paper, you're asking people to get up, go back in and bid one more time, and it just doesn't work. Another, and since we're on the topic in, uh, another topic that thing that doesn't work is we're going to close the silent auction during dinner. If you close the silent auction during dinner, one of two things is you're not one of two things is going to happen. Either people are going to continually get up during the dinner to go out to bid one more time, and maybe two more times, and keep checking on their bids, or two, that's not going to happen, and nobody gets up, and so your silent auction just ends with a thud. Right. End it with a deadline, end it with a bang, and move people on. That's my recommendation. Even if there's items that, that don't have bids on them, it does not matter. It's more important to start, to finish your auction, sound auction on time and start the rest of your program than it is to, you know, let that tail wag the dog. I think that's really important to reiterate there. That's exactly um, right. And you might fudge just a little bit. If something didn't get a silent uh, a bid in the silent auction, you can kind of maneuver it around and put it in another section, you know, because you really don't want to take it home. But, you know, again, don't let the tail wag the dog. If people don't want the item, they don't want the item. 
Love it. Now, of course, there's an exception to every rule, but right. for the most part, that's good advice. And I'll, we, we definitely have some more questions that we're going to get to here. I just want to um, invite people, if, if you can't stick with us, you're welcome to, to leave. We're going to be sending out a, a recording of the webinar. Uh, it should hopefully be this afternoon or early tomorrow morning. Uh, so you can you know, check in and, and listen to the Q&A um, you know, on the YouTube video. Uh, but we're just going to continue on with, with a few more questions here. So if you're interested, please stick with us. Um, I think this is just a fantastic question from Susan Pierce. Uh, how soon should you have final figures? And do you announce the net or the gross? Do you announce the amount that raised <laughs> that night, silent auction, and the fund to need, or do you subtract expenses, etc.? What is what do you typically do? I, I've never heard that question before. I think it's great. Wow. Well, and um, actually, it's an item that comes up a lot in my consultation, and it's a great, great question. I mean, it, it truly is a great question. Let's, let's take them one at a time. One right. is how soon should you know how much money you raised? If you're using electronic, I mean, if you're using a computerized clerking system and if you're not using, utilizing a computer clerking system like Greater Giving, and there's a lot of other ones out there, if you're not doing that, you're stuck in the 1950s. So get rid of those file folders, get electronic, and, and learn how to do it and make it work for you. I think you should know how much money you raised that night. You should have already done all the calculations for what all your expenses are because you know what they are, or at least you're going to be pretty close to it, and you should really know the night of the event. And people love knowing that they were part of a winning team that night. Now, do you announce, do you announce the net or the gross? There's reasons to do both, and you have to decide for yourself. If you had an event, and I'm just going to throw out numbers here. Why don't you you just tell people real quick uh, the difference between the two as well, so for those who don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. The gross is the amount of money that came in from all the revenue sources, from from sponsorships to live auctions, uh, special appeal and silent auction, along with ticket sales. The net is what happens is when you subtract out all the expenses. And, of course, we're going to have expenses. We're going to have food costs. We're going to have, you know, there's lots of different, you know, decorations, your professional benefit auctioneer. There's going to be different expenses. But you should have those in hand night of to know how much you're, you're going to raise. Now, if you announce the gross, it feels then- really good to the chairman and to everyone else. And, wow, we just raised, you know, $150,000. But let's say it cost you $30,000 to put on the event. So that's really a net of 120 that goes into the coffers. And it's really you, you have to decide yourself which, which you'd rather do. But, you know, if you announce the gross and everyone thinks you put 150 into your into your bank account, if you announce the net, well, you really raised 150 and people are like, where'd that money go? So, right. It's really up. It's really up to you, and I have clients that do both things. So I apologize. It's a great question, but I don't have the magical answer here for this. But when I base my numbers, I base it, you know, upon gross. You base it on gross, and not gross okay. of the entire event, but gross upon the parts that I where I work. Which is the like typically the live auction fund of need, etc. Mm-hmm. That's exactly okay. right. Got it. Yeah, I don't Very get involved good. in ticket sales and sponsorships. Fair enough. Great, great question, Susan. Um, real quick, let's just address this one really quick uh, for Rose. Uh, it's her first auction. Best of luck, Rose. Uh, and what's the benefits to closing the bidding by section? And why not all at the same time? Just real quick, two sentences. What would you have to say about that, yep. Scott? Create the bidding frenzy by closing it in sections. That way you're not trying to close it all at one time and the logistical nightmare that can occur with that. Love it. Uh, let's see. And can you offend donors? Uh, this is from Katie Brown again. Can you offend donors uh, whose items aren't in the super silent auction? Um, I, I always say I wouldn't worry about that. Um, what, what have your, what's your experience been like, Scott? Yes, you can offend donors, but you know, you can offend almost anybody at any time. But remember, keep your eye on the prize. When a donor finds out that they can control you by being demanding, they're going to only become more demanding all the time. Be upfront and honest 
and tell them that it's going to go through a vetting uh, committee to determine what we we can't promise it will be in the super silent. Well, then I won't give my item. Well, I understand, but we can't promise right now. We'll do our best, but we can't promise right now. And if they take it away, you know what? That person had ulterior motives to begin with. So sometimes you have to distance yourself from people. It might cost you a little bit of money in the short run, but you'll win in the long run. It's a great point. I never thought about it that way. That's awesome. Oh, Um, and donors are, you know, oh, my goodness. You know, they want prime (laughs) placement. They want they want recognition. They and then when you've done all that for them, they're still not happy. Right. So watch those folks. Watch those folks. They'll drive you crazy. Fair enough. Uh, This one's from uh, Kim Sheehy. Uh, Sorry if I butchered your name there, Kim. Um, Definitely seen her before. Do you recommend doing sections by type instead of value, i.e. travel, sports, home, fashion? What do you think? In you the know, that's option. almost yeah. like a chicken and egg question, and we could we can debate that all day long and still not come uh, and come. I personally don't like uh, by category. Some people love to do it by category, so it's kind of up to what your history has been. Uh, People don't. People resist change. So if you've normally grouped them into, you know, beauty and fashion, and that uh, tends to make a difference. It's especially important to do it if you have a lot of silent auction items. My personal preference is is to intermix them all so that people will see all the silent auctions and items, and they won't just go to sports and leisure, which is where I would probably typically go. Right. Um, and I would never see that pearl necklace that was available that my wife would love to have because I'm not going to the jewelry section. So that's my own personal. Oh, one thing on jewelry sections, you probably do want to have them separate because you've got to have additional security when you have jewelry. Oh, right. I know everybody thinks everyone's fine and wonderful, but, boy, that's a, that's a real heartache and heartbreak when a piece of jewelry walks out. Wow. That's important. Um, oh, and just one more thing. Don't right. put the real gift certificates on the tables. <laughs> Make a copy of that gift certificate. You keep the real ones at checkout. Don't put the real gift certificates on the table. Yep, those keep are small the honest easy people to, honest. Easy to grab. There you go. Uh, this question's from Robin Luther. Uh, if, if you have additional fundraising activities, a raffle, a 50-50, a wine pool, uh, can you run these concurrently to the silent auction at the same time? Uh, what do you recommend? Um. Again, be careful not to let the tail wag the dog. And by that, what I mean is, yes, if you're going to do those uh, revenue enhancers, and a lot of my colleagues in the business are all about the revenue enhancers because they all total up and it all looks really great, just be careful that you don't beat people over the head uh, with too many uh, of the revenue enhancers. You know, hitting them up for a five dollar raffle ticket, or and and then a, a wine pull here and this that we've nickeled and dimed them so much that we we forgot that we're not going to get the big money from them later because we've badgered them too much. My quick story on raffle tickets is I went to an auction I as an attendee one time, and uh, this gentleman comes up and he was kind of obnoxious. And he says, don't you want to buy this raffle ticket for $10? And I ask, you mean, and then he'll give me a blinky pen so that I don't get asked anymore. And I go, you mean for $10 you'll go away and never come back? He goes, yes. I gave him $10. So, oh, I mean, funny. and this was an event that was, gonna, that was planning to raise a quarter of a million dollars. And they ticked me off over $10. It wasn't a very wow. good choice on their part. I'd say so. Um Getting a good question here. Just a few more left, folks, uh, from Karen Blake. Uh, talk, asking a little bit more about clarification on the location of the silent auction. Uh, you know, do you want to set up next to the bar? Do you set it up in the ballroom? Or if you have the option not to set it up in the ballroom, do you set it up outside the ballroom? Uh, what do you typically recommend for the ideal location of your tables, and how spread out should they be? Oh, great question, especially the last portion of it. Um, in an ideal situation, you have a ballroom that's the dining room, and that's where everyone's going to go and move in, migrate into for the live auction. You're going to have a separate area for the silent auction slash cocktail hour. Um, that's how you'd best set it up. Uh, for spacing, I call it the 18-inch rule. We want the items to be spaced 18 inches apart. And if you say, oh, well, we don't have room for that, we've got to get them a lot closer, then you have too many items. 
18 inches apart. Let people be able to stand in front uh, of the item, and the the next item is still available to you. There's also the two-butt rule. And what that means is if two people are bent over a table, one in in opposite directions, there's still a passway to go through. And that means the tables need to be at least six feet uh, across from each other. So if you bend forward, you can still walk through. But if you can divide and conquer, that's great. If you have to, I'll be everything in the in the room. Then I would ring the silent auction around the outside of the room, ring it around the outside or in the back. Either one works. Either one works. But bring out ends velvet uh, ropes. So we don't want people going in and sitting down at their table. And especially if it's a preset salad and starting to eat. We want people in the silent auction area because we want movement in the room. Don't allow the people to go into the dining room. And above all else, have reserved seating because the person who's going to get the best seat is the person who's not going to spend any money. They just want to watch the show. Put the money up front for the live auction. I hope that answered the question. I think so. Uh, Let's see. We uh, and I appreciate everyone staying on the line because I know it's we're we're running a little extra, but uh, hopefully we're providing good information. So we do bid boards and use live auctioneers. Our committee wants to do away with the silent auction altogether. Your thoughts this is from Ann Wolford. Ann, boy, it depends upon the history of the event. I do the big board at, at a couple of events and. They work, but the problem is they tend to be a little bit time-consuming, and I think they tend to uh, cannibalize the live auction a little bit because it's really just a faster version of the live auction. I, You're asking people for their attention twice. I would be suspect of, of doing the big board and eliminating the silent auction. But one of the things about the big board is that it tends to take up less room. So if if uh, room and spacing is a problem, then maybe it is a better idea. But one of the keys to the big board is that you got to get people to bid ahead of time. And to do that, you've got to have the carnival barkers, if you will, out there calling people over, getting them to bid early, so that when the live auctioneer shows up, we've already got several bids um, already on the board and able to go forward. If you're asking about what's a big board, because I realize I didn't explain that, it means that people are able to pre-bid and then on on auction items, and then the auctioneer comes over and does a live auction on the spot starting at the beginning of the last bid. So if the last bid was at $500, I'd be asking for $550. $550 now six, six hundred dollars sold $550 the next item. Got it. Is 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 how that works. Got it. Hopefully that uh, answered your question, Deshaun, and because uh, I just got someone. What is a bid board? Um, this is a good question. Yeah. <coughs> I'm not a big Excuse fan me. of the big board. I'm I'm not a big fan of the big board. I think it cannibalizes the live auction. Fair enough. This is a good question from Sarah Torres. If a product or service um, was procured via consignment partnership or purchased up front, should you highlight the cost at the table to the bidders? No. Now, this is my own personal opinion. My own personal opinion is no, you should not talk about the cost because you probably just put a ceiling. You thought you were putting a floor on the price, but probably what you did was you just put a ceiling on the price. Oh, that item cost $4,200. Therefore, you know, I shouldn't pay much more than that for the item. Well, that's, you know. That doesn't. That's not what we're looking for. We're wanting people to pay more for the item. And some people don't in your audience aren't completely going to understand consignment. Well, if they don't get it donated, I don't want to buy it. Well, that sounds great, but you can't get the kind of packages that a group like Winspire can provide. They're providing items that you simply can't put together yourself. So to answer your question, I would not put the cost in the program because I think it lowers the value of the item. Because remember, value is all about perception. And what you perceive the value of that item to be is what the value of the item is. You know, it's kind of like artwork. As I always say when I'm selling uh, original art, the more you pay for it, the more it's worth. And I hopefully everyone just chuckled. But seriously, if the item has never been sold before, 
as a lot as art, um, your whatever you pay for it is fair market value. So right. perception is everything. Yeah, we we talk a lot about perceived value here at Winspire. Um, you know, it's if you put costs out there, like you just said, it puts that ceiling in their mind. But what you're what you're what you care about more at these events is creating that momentum, that energy, that excitement. You know, around the compression, the bidding frenzy. People are gonna pay a lot more attention to who else is bidding and how much bids are there than they are gonna worry about the exact retail retail value. Because at the end of the day, this is all for a fundraiser, right? So people are you know whether they even during the paddle raise or the fund of need, you know whether they donate. $200 or $1,000. It's all about the energy in the room. Same thing goes for the auction items that you're selling, whether it's your live auction or your silent auction. It's about that perceived value. So if you can close your sections appropriately, you have the right imagery and the right display out there that's going to get them excited. Uh, regard, it doesn't matter how much it actually costs. It's They're, they're going to end up bidding a lot more, sometimes twice as much as the package is actually worth, which bodes well for you because then it goes more towards your cause. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really all about features and benefits. You know, every salesman knows about features and benefits. At a fundraising auction, we want to talk about the benefits. Because if grandma gra grandma and grandpa buy a vacation package, that they're going to be able to take their children and their grandchildren with them to a, a great, you know, like Cabo, San Lucas. And so they're going to go together as a family. That's priceless. That's absolutely priceless. And right. they're helping the cause along the way. That's great. Uh, just a couple more and questions a, and here. And, of course, oh, that's part of the uh, – another reason to have a professional fundraising auctioneer that specializes in fundraising. We, we eat, sleep, and breathe how to, set the, how to set the table to make these kind of results happen. You know, regular auctioneers, they sell product. We sell people. And people Love give it. to people. They don't give to causes. Right. And I know Don, Danny Hooper uh, talks a lot about, too, like, uh, you know, typical auctioneers, they're talking about how much can we get out of this individual item? No, it's more about how much can we extract out of the room as a whole, you know, using the energy and the momentum and the excitement to to get everyone to bid more and get more excited about the items or the fund of need or whatever. Um, that is going to be the key to getting people to bid more, not the items themselves, you know, kind of the small details. It's more about this timeline and getting it all to work in conjunction with each other. Yeah. And everybody realize that audience development is a year round activity. You don't just ask people a month before to come to your fundraising event. You need to develop that auction year round. And the best way to do that, be grateful for their donations year round and educate them year round so that when you see them and your hand is finally out, you, you, every time you see them, your hand isn't out. You're you're thanking them. You're giving them information about how their money is impacting uh, the people that they're trying to impact and you're impacting uh, this year. So that when you see them next year, they're more ready to give. Great. Three more questions, and we're going to let you guys go. Uh, this one from Jenny Iverson. Two checkout ar areas versus one checkout area. We've always had one checkout area. Uh, six stations because people hate going to multiple places. Do you suggest trying the two area approach? Uh, we use a large board with all the numbers on our bidders. If you want something in the silent, we highlighted our number, um, you know, and then email their receipt. Um, you know, what do you, what are your thoughts on that checkout strategy of the fulfillment versus? Yeah. Jenny, I'm a big believer is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Yep. And I mean, if what you have is working and everybody's happy and you're able to produce the results you're wanting, why would you change? I wouldn't change. I just tell you that I see lots of times that when you separate the cashier from fulfillment, it makes everything flow smoother. But if that if your current situation is working for you, I'd keep right on doing what you're doing because it's working. It's working. We don't need to make more things more complicated than they are. Simple is great, especially when it works. Love it. Three more, just three more questions real quick. Jennifer Bode asks about, does the timeline change at all if you're doing food stations as opposed to a sit-down dinner? Can you start serving oh. food during the silent auction? Food stations. I hate them. <laughs> oh, really? I hate them. <laughs> And the reason that I hate them is we're not being able to divide and conquer. Are they less expensive? Yes. Uh, do people say, oh, we love those? Well, whatever. But 
realize we said we wanted movement in the room, but we don't want the movement going to the food stations. Uh, right. And for the live auction, how do you ever capture their attention? If everyone's seated at a table, I've got them where I want them, right? And they're going to stay without movement in the room. Um, so I'm, I'm against food stations. But you're doing food stations, so we have to live with that. Yes, food stations can, can certainly work. They can certainly work, and it should be during the silent auction. But realize you're, you should start the food station either earlier or later. Don't let the food compete with your closing time of your silent auction. If someone has food in front of them, especially if they've been drinking, and they have the option to eat or go bid on an item, they're going to eat. Right. So watch point. when your service is going on. Uh, and when you start it so that it doesn't compete and conflict with your closing time of your silent auction. Two more questions Remember, here. Remember, in the silent auction, we want movement. In the live auction, we don't want movement. Great. Two more questions. Uh, this is from Cynthia Klinger. Do you uh, like guaranteed bid prices for an item such as buy it now? Um, if so, how much do you recommend for that buy it now price? Oh, um, I like I like uh, guaranteed, and re- everybody realize you can't use buy it now because eBay has that trademarked. So you have to say something else like guaranteed bid, uh, purchase now. now, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to make sure it's different than what uh, what eBay says. Um, my recommendation is yes, there should be that on on almost. You should do it on a case by case basis, but almost on everything, and it should be a hundred and fifty to two hundred percent. Of, of the value of the item uh, is my recommendation, but evaluate it on an individual basis. Now, if you have an item that, you know, sure, there's a retail for it, but you know it's going to receive a lot of attention, don't put the guaranteed purchase price on it because you may be leaving money on the table. If you think there's a possibility of leaving money on the table, then don't offer the guaranteed price. Let it keep running. But I would imagine in most silent auctions, that's not going to be more than five items. But again, evaluate each one on an individual price. And if it's a lesser quality, if it's a lesser interesting item, then I'd make it 150%. If it's 200%, that's even better. You know, the silent, a silent auction, the national statistic, is that silent auction items typically bring about 60% of retail value overall, as a whole, across the country. And hopefully, you know, you're able to do a little better than that. But if you're able to get 150% of the item, I'd say you'd be very happy. Heck, if you're able to get 80% of the item, you should be very happy. There's exceptions right. to every rule, but, you know, that's, that's kind of how it works. Yep. From a, national, uh, from a national perspective. That's great. And last question here, Scott. Uh, where do you find local professional fundraising auctioneers? Is there a membership, membership or association to reference for names? Uh, let me first say that uh, we can always provide um, referrals for people in your area. We work with nonprofits around the country, and we have uh, you know, our own uh, auctioneer partner, Scott being one of them for the Southeast, uh, that we refer to. But if you, you're looking for referrals, uh, we are absolutely one of our event consultants, fundraising specialists, is absolutely able to help with that. But, but Scott, I'll let you take that. Well, and, you know, and, and Winspire would be a great resource for, uh, just for that because you vetted the people. Uh, right. For benefit auctioneers, the National Auctioneers Association, I'm a very active member, and we have a group called the Benefit Auction Specialist, and that means that everyone has received uh, multiple days of training. They've had to jump through the hoops to get that designation, and there's only about 200, I think it's 250 currently um, you know, in the country that are, ben- that are designated benefit auction specialists, but the National Auctioneers Association would be able to help you with that, so that's NAA. Dot org. Uh, there's also a group of us that get together once a year at the Benefit Auction Summit that's special by the uh, sp- uh, sponsored by the National Auctioneers Association. I attend every year, and I y- usually get talked into presenting because uh, you know I- I've got a lot of experience that I can share. And so, if that's called the B Benefit Auction Summit, but your best uh, advice would be go to Winspire. Uh, it would be contact me. My contact information is on the, the VOE. I know fundraising auctioneers from around the country. 
Um, so, you know, reach out to one of us, and I'm sure we can help you. So that NAA.org, I believe it's NAA.org. Maybe it's NationalAuctioneers.org. Yeah. yeah, just Google um, National Auctioneer. Definitely Google Benefit Auctioneer Specialist. Uh, they provide a great uh, kind of Rolodex of, of, you know, auctioneers that are certified in this. I know that I, I just, that's where I just saw you recently. Uh, when was that? Was that in August or September? Was the Benefit Auctioneer Summit yes. in San Diego? Um, and we actually just started, you know, talking about doing this webinar, uh, it was kind of the genesis of it here. So, and I got to meet a lot of, uh, you know, auctioneers from around the country and, uh, some outstanding talent out there, um, uh, who are now doing, you know, they're taking a much bigger role in advising nonprofits. You know, when you, when you do go and, you know, ask for an auctioneer and are considering it, ask if they'll do consulting with you or meet with you before and guide you because they have a lot of experience going through these events as Scott has just demonstrated. And they, they know a lot of best practices, um, especially in your area, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and you can, you know, take that and really run with it. So highly recommend, uh, you know, going out and finding a good uh, uh, benefit auctioneer specialist for your event. Yeah. And, you know, and to, to piggyback on that just a little bit, most people hire me uh, because of my stage presence the night of the event. But where they find that I really add value is in consulting before the event, uh, you know. I've been doing this for a long time. I've done thousands of events. I've raised, you know, more than a hundred million dollars just in the last five years. So, chances are, I've, you know, I've been there before. I've seen it, and I can tell you the uh, good side and the downside. And sometimes it goes both ways. Right. Absolutely. That's great. And um, just real quick, I know uh, uh, Blanky. I for, I for, we didn't answer your question about the best time to your fund an item. Raise your paddle because we're going to be talking about that in part three. Um, I, if you see up on the screen, uh, definitely please register for part two of this webinar series where we're going to be talking all about the live auction, uh, the paddle raising, and the fun, the fun and need is going to be in part three. Uh, but part two is January 17th. You can register here at u.winspireme.com backslash timeline dash part two. I'll be sending out this link with the recording to the webinar um, very shortly, hopefully this afternoon or tomorrow morning. I want to thank um, everyone out there for joining us today uh, and coming here to join us for this webinar. And, and most of all, I want to thank Scott Robertson. It's been an absolute pleasure collaborating with you and um, really sharing this knowledge. And I look forward to, to doing more of it here again in the near future. Uh, and, and I just want to congratulate Winspire again. You know, Win, Winspire is doing this to educate the fundraising auction community out there, you know, in no way is this a uh, self-promotion thing. So I so I so uh, admire Winspire for doing it, and I'm happy to play a role, hopefully, in the success. And I sure hope that people are able to take this information and raise money to impact the lives of others. Thank you for all that you do for other people, because it's such a it's such a wonderful group of people that host fundraising auctions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, please stay tuned for that email coming out with, uh, with the recording. Again, we hope to see you at part two uh, coming up on January 17th. That's a Tuesday uh, where we talk all about live auctions. So thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you there soon. Thank you, Ann. Thanks, Scott.